గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ ఎవరి వన్ సో థ్యాంక్ యూ సో మచ్ సార్ సో మై సెల్ఫ్ డాక్టర్ రాకేష్ అండి కన్సల్టెంట్ హియర్ సో ఇన్ ద నెక్స్ట్ ఫ్యూ మినిట్స్ ఐమ్ గోయింగ్ టు టేక్ యూ రిగార్డింగ్ ది అడ్వాన్స్ హిమోడైనమిక్ మానిటరింగ్ సో ఐఎమ్ నాట్ గోయింగ్ టు కంప్లీట్ కంప్లీట్లీ కవర్ ద స్పెక్ట్రమ్ ఆఫ్ ఇన్వేజివ్ హిమోడైనిక్ మానిటరింగ్ సో ఐఎమ్ గోయింగ్ టు కవర్ ఓన్లీ త్రీ టాపిక్స్ ఇయర్ సో వన్ ఈజ్ యువర్ పిక్కో వన్ దన్ ఈజ్ ఎల్ డిట్కో అండ్ దెన్ యువర్ ఫ్లో ట్రాక్ సో దీస్ ఆర్ ద త్రీ టాపిక్స్ విచ్ ఐమ్ గోయింగ్ టు కవర్ హియర్ so basically what is meant by hemodynamic monitoring as you all know by this point of time it's like monitoring the physiological variables over time so just monitoring per se will not help the improvement of the patients okay you need to do a timely intervention and you need to do a right intervention so to do to do this you need to understand what are the basic physiology of the patient you need to understand the physiology of the monitor and you need to correlate clinically both of them in that point only then only you can do a timely right intervention that helps for the outcome of the patient so these are the three things which i'm going to cover pico lidco and then flow track so next pico i'm going to cover what is the method here what are the principles involved so what are the various variables which are going to cover so indication is same for any type of hemodynamic monitoring so indication is uh, like shock is it a septic shock or a cardiogenic shock or a hypovolemic shock sepsis trauma patients and then pulmonary edema patients so you don't know what's the reason for the pulmonary edema in those situations also you can go for hemodynamic monitoring acute lung injury burns patient for uh, what is a for uh, uh, fluid resuscitations and any condition that requires assessment of hemodynamic or volumetric functions so these indications stand still for any type of hemodynamic monitoring so let us see what are the principles involved in your pico so pico uses combination of two techniques here so one is advanced hemodynamic monitoring which can be done by means of your transpernal delaval elution and volumetric monitoring which can be done by your pulse contour analysis so these are the basic two principles involved here one is palmo dilution thermo dilution method and pulse contour analysis so all types of hemodynamic monitors advanced they have a combination of these two techniques they might change a little bit if you are using a lithium dilution technique we call it as lidco if you are using a thermo dilution technique we call it as a transpernal dilution we can use a central line or you can use a palmarate cath also so what is meant uh, so next slides i'll tell you about what is meant by transpernal thermo dilution so you need to insert two catheters specifically for your transpernal thermo dilution one is your central line which has uh, which should be having a thermistor port and then arterial line also which is specific for the pico it comes with a it comes with a yeah you can see this one uh, it comes with a trans, uh, temperature sensor here so these two things are mandatory to have a pico the, so this is how the pico system looks on a, a real time patient actually so you need to have a patient here a central line with the thermistor which i am speaking here so this is connected to the monitor which senses the temperature of the saline which you are giving here and then it goes on it goes on to the right side of the heart and then comes to the left side of the heart and you need to place a arterial line in the femoral system and it also comes with a temperature sensor which got an interface and then connected to the same monitor so this monitor is the one which differentiates the temperature between the injectate and the blood so this is the main monitor and then there is a pressure transducer system which is routine for your all invasive hemodynamic monitoring so transpulmonary dilution dilution you need to suppo- you are supposed to inject a cold saline through a central venous catheter and the amount of cold saline temperature of the cold saline should be entered first into the monitor so monitor should be given an order that this amount of volume i am injecting and this amount of cold saline i am injecting so that mixes with the blood volume and passes to the right side as i as i told it earlier so after passing the left heart the arterial line measures the drop in the temperature because you are giving a cold saline here what happens to your blood temperature there is a drop in the temperature that is measured by the arterial end of the catheter and then from that drop in temperature it will extrapolate a curve that is called as a thermo dilution curve and based on applying applying some equation called stewart hamilton equation on the thermo dilution curve it will give us some cardiac output that is a uh, what is a routine hemodynamic monitoring so this is the thermo dilution curve i am talking about so this is the base of the tem- basal temperature of the blood here once you inject the cold saline the drop in the temperature has been sensed by the arterial catheter and once the drop in the temperature is completed it again come back to normal so this is actually one cardiac cycle if you say that but actually what happens here uh, in with, with with one cardiac cycle your temperature will never return to normal so it will have a gradual slope here by applying some physics here and then we just try to extrapolate the curve and then it will calculate the cardiac output so that equation is called as stewart hamilton's equation is it is it visible yeah the stewart hamilton equation yeah. it is given by the formula temperature difference into volume of the injected that is sorry volume of the injected that is given to the patient with a constant this constant is actually 
derived based upon the specific gravity of the blade and the amount of volume that you are injecting and then divided by the area under the curve. So this is the area under the curve and this one comes your temperature difference into volume into constant. So it can clearly see that area under the curve is inversely proportional to the cardiac output. So if the area under the curve is high, cardiac output is low. If the curve area under the curve is low, the cardiac output is high. Clear? So what are the common artifacts you see? So generally you get this type of uh, thermodilution curve, but there are some artifacts which we generally see while monitoring these thermodilution curves. So this, this one will show the area under the curve is very high or the time taken for the temperature to fall is very high. That means the cardiac output is low. You can see here the time taken by the temperature to come down to normal is very less. So it is a high cardiac output curve. Clear? Sometimes there is a poor injection technique where this 20 ml of uh, saline boluses should be given at a time. It should not be supposed to be as a, uh, what do you say, intermittent techniques. It should be given as a particular bolus. If you are giving in a poor injection technique, this type of curves will come in which the monitor will not accept. This is the respiratory artifact which we generally see. So what are the various other difficulties generally we face while using a thermodilution curves? It might be your tricuspid regurgitation or it might be your pulmonary regurgitations or intracardiac actions. Whenever there is a structural heart disease, make sure that your thermodilution curves or your cardiac output monitors are not perfectly accurate. So what happens? Let us see. So what happens if there is a tricuspid regurgitation or a pulmonary regurgitation, the amount of saline or the dye which you are giving on the right side of the heart, what happens? It will get diluted. It will get more amount of blood comes to the right side of the heart, so it will get diluted and it will take a long temperature decay times. That means the temperature on the x-axis will be prolonged. That means what happens? It indicates an erroneously low cardiac output. Clear? Whenever you have shunts, what happens to the shunts? If there is a right to left shunt, whatever the amount of dye which you are giving on the right side of the heart, it bypasses the right ventricular system, lung, and then directly goes into the left side of the heart and then sensed by the sensor. In those situations, what happens is time taken by the sun, temperature to drop is very less here. So erroneously, it will record a high cardiac output. Again, the left to run sense is reversed for that. The amount of drug which you are giving is diluted again. The time taken will be long and then the cardiac output is erroneously showed as a less. So am I clear till now? So these are the various difficulties which we face when you have a structural heart problem. So keep these things in mind. Don't just go by the values. So one more thing as I am telling earlier, this is the actual thermodilution curve which happens, there is a recirculation that happens after one cardiac cycle. But we try to extrapolate that curve towards the x-axis making it as a one complete cardiac cycle. So based on these values, these monitors will give us some parameters like intrathoracic thermal volume, intrathoracic pulmonary volumes, these parameters. So these are the main things you need to know. One is the mean transit time, the another one is called as a downward slope time. So mean transit time is defined as the amount of the indicator, half of the indicator should be passing the injection of the artery. So the amount of indicator, the amount of, uh, what is the volume which is given to the patient, if the half amount of them has been completely passing to the arterial end, we call it as a mean transit time. The time taken for it to pass the arterial end is called as a mean transit time. And the slope, the rate of coming down, that is called as slope, that is called exponential time of the downward slope curve. So once these values have been taken by the monitor, so it will give us these different parameters. So it can be calculated by using different things. It can be clearly seen here. The total amount of blood volume which is present in the thorax is called as intrathoracic thermal volume. It includes RA, RV, blood volume, extravascular lung volume and LA and LV. So it is given by the formula cardiac output into the mean transit time. The time taken by the dilutant calca, I mean multiplied with your cardiac output gives you the inter, I mean like uh, intrathoracic thermal volume. The next one is pulmonary thermal volume. So amount of blood which is present only in the lungs, whether it is an extravascular lung water or whether it is a pulmonary blood volume, both together it comes your pulmonary thermal volume. It can be given by the formula cardiac output into downward slope time. Okay. And the next one, by differentiating or minus or by subtracting these two things, you can get global and digest and diastolic volume. That is called GEDV. Okay. And then if you want to multiply the GEDV with 1.25 because the dermal volume which is present in the lungs is almost 1.25 times the global and diastolic volume, we'll get intrathoracic blood volume. If you say dermal volume, it includes your extravascular lung water. If you say blood volume, it does not include extravascular lung water. So by calculating dermal volume and blood volume, the difference simply gives you how much amount of water is present in the extravascular space of the lung. So you can treat the pulmonary edema here. So this is how the monitor derives all the values and based on these values you are going to treat your particular patient. Right? So, 
So till now I discussed about the thermal dilution curve. What are the variables here? Next is your pulse contour analysis, which is common for any type of arterial blood pressure monitoring. So this pulse contour analysis, what it do? It gives a continuous cardiac output based on the stroke volume calculation. So it calculates the area under the curve of your arterial line, which is particularly restricted to your systole. So systolic part of the curve, area under the curve is called as stroke volume. So when it is multiplied to heart rate, it gets your cardiac output. This is how this pulse contour analysis will calculate your cardiac output. And then there is something called as, there is a formula here. Calibration factor. So this calibration factor, why are you doing this actually dermodilution runs and why are you doing these calibrations once in a while? Because you need to derive a calibration factor from your dermodilution curve. Once you derive the calibration factor, heart rate is already known to the machine. So this PICO machine will then de uh, display your cardiac output based on this complex formula. Okay. So I'm not going to details of this formula, but you need to have your calibration factor, you need to have your heart rate, you need to have the area under the curve, which is your stroke volume. You need to know the chaotic compliance, which can also be derived from the curve. The rate of downward slope time gives your aortic compliance and shape of the curve. So based on all these factors, this PICO will give you an exact cardiac output. Clear? So, but it causes, uh, it has so many prerequisites actually. The patient should be 100% mechanically ventilated. No spontaneous breath is allowed in these patients if you want to calculate the exact cardiac output. And the tidal volume for this patient should be around 6 to 8 ml per kg. Patient should not have any arrhythmias and you're not supposed to allow any spontaneous breath while calculating the PICO. So, this is one thing which uh, pulse contour analysis also will do stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation if you so many i mean so many of us will monitor these things the arterial pressure will change along with your respirations so this is the inspiration and this is the expression that's happening here so these monitors will display one more variable called as stroke volume variation given by this formula the stroke volume maximum minus the minimum divided by your mean okay that gives your stroke volume variation which should be less than 10 percent if it is more than 10 percent the patient is hemodynamically unstable or hypovolemic so taking these three values from the temperature and time graph, the cardiac output, MTT and DSD, PICO estimates your cardiac output, PICO estimates your preload, which is nothing but your intrathoracic blood volume, and degree of pulmonary edema, which is nothing but your extravascular lung water index. So index and volumes are same. If you, I mean like if you multiply, uh, sorry, if you uh, divide by your body weight, uh, body surface area, you'll get an index here. So both the values are nearly the same. So these are the various thermodilution parameters which are supposed to get while using PICO, the cardiac output, cardiac index, preload, it might be a global endiastolic index or intrathoracic blood volume index, pulmonary edema, as I said, it's an extra lung water index or pulmonary vascular permeability index. There is one more called as permeability index of the pulmonary vasculature where the extra vascular lung volume divided by your pulmonary blood volume, contractility of the heart, which is given by means of your cardiac function index and then global ejection fraction. Coming to pulse contour parameters, these pulse contour parameters will give you the flow, pulse contour based cardiac output, arterial blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume which is area under the systolic part of the curve. Volume responsiveness is assessed by means of either your stroke volume variation or your pulse, pul I mean pulse pressure variation. The same thing. If you take the volume, it's called as stroke volume variation. If you take the pressure in the graph, it is called as per pulse pressure variation. Or you can have a systolic pressure variation also. But you need to know the normal values. Normal pulse pressure variation should be less than 30. Normal systolic pressure variation should be less than 10 millimeters of mercury. So afterload is again given by your SVRI, I mean like systemic vascular resistance index. Contractility and index of left and right. So these are various parameters which can be given by pulse contour parameters. So combine these two parameters, you need to adjust for the patient's clinical status and then decide in the algorithm what you're going to do for this particular patient. See, the goal of hemodynamic monitoring is whether you want to add a drug or whether you want to delete a drug, whether you want to load the patient with fluids or whether you want to uh, dehydrate him by giving some diuretics also. So if you can see this flow chart, first thing which you should monitor your is cardiac index. If the cardiac index is low, next step is monitoring your intrathoracic blood volume index. So if it is also low and then it's the extra vascular lung volume which is also low, that means the patient is hypovolemic. So in these conditions, you need to suppose you give a volume bolus to the patient and then observe for the responses. And the targets is again the same in the reverse order it was written. So if you are able to achieve the targets, that's you are doing a good thing here. Right? If the cardiac index is low, volume is low, and then pulmonary edema is high, in these situations you need to give volume very cautiously and then you need to add a catecholamines. So and then assess for the response. Okay. Coming here, if the cardiac index is low with the volume is high, again pulmonary edema, see the pulmonary edema. Whatever the situation, if the volume is very high, in both the situations you need to give catecholamines, but only if there is pulmonary edema, extravascular lung water is very high, in those situations you need to have a diuretic here. 
and then assess the response. So but this is actually a temporary measure what they suggest is give a diuretic and see whether the response is coming in terms of your targets here. So this is one part of the curve where your cardiac index is less. If the cardiac index is high with the volume normal or low here, if there is volume less in the lungs, I think again the fluids here. If the cardiac index is high with the volume less in the lungs and then extravascular lung volume is very high, again the volume, but it's a temporary measure, you can also wait here. If the cardiac index is good, intrathoracic blood volume is good with a pulmonary edema is less than 10, extravascular lung volume is less than 10, you can wait here. This is a normal patient actually. If that is also high, you can add some I mean, sorry, a diuretics here. You can do some volume contraction. Always try to see the responses here. So whether you are doing correct for the patient or not. So this flowchart, everyone needs to know. So by doing this flowchart, you can only do this. Uh, what do you say? Uh, small monitor, small changes in the patient. So right till now, what you have learned? You have learned about how the PICO system works. What are the basic principles involved? How it is used to guide for the patient? What are the various parameters like preload, afterload, cardiac output? And then what are extravascular lung water indexes and the intrathoracic blood volume, these things are turned. So last four points you need to see on the machine itself. So what should be the arterial pressure port labeled? So we have a uh, workshop in the evening, so we can learn from there. Uh, what are the determinants for accuracy of calculations? But I said the prerequisites again here. What are the recommended volumes for saline and what are the recommended temperatures? Again, you can go and see in the uh, workshop. So CRRT and then patients on other hemodynamic monitors like IABP on ECMO. So monitoring your cardiac output is very difficult here. So you can have this talk in the evening session. Clear? So I'll move on to next topic, LITCO. <coughs> As I said, indications are almost uh, common for LITCO, PICO or any hemodynamic monitoring. You need to know the contraindications here. We have used a di-dilution technique. So any psychiatric patients who are on lithium salts, it overestimates your cardiac output. And patients less than 40 kgs, its accuracy has not been defined. First trimester of pregnancy because of the fatal toxicity. So one more condition called peripheral vascular diseases where your pulse contour waveform will be completely destroyed and then the software unable to unable to calculate your pulse contour waveform in a patients who are having a peripheral vascular disease and patients undergoing uh, treatments with intra aortic balloon pumps. And one more thing is some muscle relaxant. So if you are using a continuous muscle relaxant for your ADS patient or you are using a bolus dose of muscle, muscle relaxants, these muscle relaxants are going to interfere with your lithium dye concentrations which is sensed by the sensor. So I'm going to show you the sensor, how it works. In those situations, instead of doing intermediate techniques, bollocks techniques of administration has to be adopted. Okay? And shunts. Yeah, any shunts, your cardiac optical monitors tend to overestimate or underestimate. Keep, keep, I mean, you should know the physiology behind that. So calibration, one more advantage of this system is no need of calibration. You need to calibrate the system for only 24 hours. <laughs> Sorry. It comes with a... It comes with a triple fold accessory pack. So the triple fold accessory pack is nothing but uh, it contains three circuits. One is park and uh, ride, so park and ride circuit. Another one is an arterial pressure uh, thermistor will be there on the arterial side. Another thing is a lithium sensor. It comes with a triple fold pack, and lithium chloride ampules will be shared. Sensor should be stored away from the di on the direct sunlight. And these wicks, I'll show you in the next slide. So these sensor wicks need to be sufficiently primed with the 0.9 percentage NS. And sensor cable ends should be always kept dry. And one more biggest advantage of using LITCO is no need of your central line. You can use the peripheral line for injecting the dye and measure the concentration on the arterial line. So in the thermodilation curves, you are measuring the temperature and in the LITCO curves, you are measuring the lithium dye concentration on the arterial line. Clear? So this is how the system will be there. So either the central line or the peripheral line, you need to inject a particular amount of lithium chloride solution with a particular concentration known. Okay, after injecting it, the other end will have an arterial transducer. So this is the arterial transducer and this is a sensor which was enlarged here. It comes with a wick inside. So this wick is going to measure your lithium concentrations. It comes with an electrode, it goes back to the monitor. And then it comes with a display thing lithium and it comes with a graph. So this graph is actually lithium dye dilution graph. The other one which you see is thermal dilution graph. And by taking the values, the same thing, the mean transit time, downward slope time is almost the same, the principle is same, and then by using this graph, it will give your cardiac output value values. Okay? So, I'll show a small video here. So, he's taking that lithium solution from the lithium ampule actually. So, you have to suppose to take 3 ml of the solution, which contains 0.3 millimoles of lithium here. So he is going to inject that into that park and ride uh, tube. This tube will not be complete. The volume of this tube is around 2 cc. So it's just loading the tube with this lithium solution and keeping the things ready. So once that is loaded, 
So he's connecting the saline flush, 20 ml of saline flush. Okay, so once that is done, so go to the arterial end. So the arterial end comes out with the arterial cannula. So he's closing the arterial cannula. I'll stop it here. And so if you can see this. So this is the bridge here. This is the lithium concentration dye, concentration measuring, uh, what do you say, that wick here says here. And there is one pump here, which comes your cardiac pulmonary bypass pump, but a smaller volume, okay? So what you're supposed to do, so once you're given the dye in the park and ride uh, cannula inside in the peripheral lines, what you're supposed to do? So after doing that, close the arterial system and try to flush the wick with some amount of blood. So once it opens it, so the blood comes from the arterial end and then flushes the wick here. So once that is done, he'll switch on the pump. This pump will go on running with a slower speed. You can see some head rotating here like your cardiac bypass pump. So once that is done, the machine will show that it's ready to inject the Lidco machine. Once you're ready to inject, give the flesh bolus here. Okay. So once you give the flesh bolus, close it and then the machine will calibrate the lithium dye concentration graph. The same as your dermodilation, but the only thing difference is the lithium concentration here. So once that is done, once you get the graph, flush the wick here, flush the sensor here, and then open it for your pulse contour analysis. Okay, here again the principle are the same. There is a dermodilution with the pulse contour analysis, here is a lithium dilution with the pulse contour analysis. And then again open it up for your routine arterial pressure monitor. So you will get a graph. So if there is an error in the graph, it is always ask us to recalibrate. You have to do this technique twice or thrice in your machine so that there should not be any error difference more than 10 to 15 percentage. Okay. Once the machine says, okay, that is fine. The calibration is done for the day. You have to recalibrate it after 24 hours. So these are the, I'll show you next slide. So again, it comes with some formula. I'll show it in the next slide. You always enter the sensor constant, which is 10.5, the conversion factor for lithium. And the dose of lithium is always 0.3 millimoles and 2 ml should be given. Patients who are having high body weight, you need to have 3 ml of lithium chloride and change the dose to 0.45. Remember, patients less than 40 kg, it's a contraindication. So it is given by this formula, lithium dose into 60 divided by area, area of the curve into 1 minus your packet cell volume. Because lithium gets distributed only in your plasma, that 1 minus PCV has come here. If you are not having an arterial lane, one more advantage is you can use your non-invasive arterial pressure monitoring, that is continuous non-invasive arterial pressure monitor, CNAP sensor, Dr. Pankaj is talking about this sensor. Even this sensor comes with a monitor that comes connected to your finger here, that will give an arterial pressure waveform. By using that arterial pressure waveform, again the pulse contour analysis can be done. Calibrating those two things, you can have so many values. So these are the various values uh, Litco gives to us. One is the cardiac output the cardiac index, SVR, SVRI, stroke volume, stroke volume variation, and then one more thing, mixed venous oxygen saturation. Clear? <coughs> the biggest advantage of using Litco is, generally if you do some fluid challenge or if you give some vasopressor, so you need to have uh, uh, older values record in your mind and then you need to see the responses. But when it comes to Litco machine, it will always display the percentage change here. So by doing the percentage change in your cardiac output and stroke volume, what are the therapy which you are giving? Is it accurate for that particular patient or not? You can have an idea. Okay, coming to flow track. So again, flow track uses the same principles, but again in flow track, there is no need for calibrations here. The biggest advantage of flow track is it's a continuous monitor, no calibrations is required. It again uses the same principles, but instead of using a dye, instead of using something called as a dye or a lithium drug, so it has, it has a continuous thermodilution curves, which an inbuilt uh, monitor, and then along with that, it uses your pulse contour analysis. So these are the various variables which you can see. The pulse contour analysis is almost the same. I'm not going to repeat that. So you need to have a specialized sensor. Okay, this specialized sensor connects your flow track machine to your monitor. Okay, then only you can have the pulse contour analysis to be done. You need to have a specialized sensor and can be connected to any arterial line. It's not any system specific. You need, you can have your switch cannulas, you can have any type of arterial lines, you can connect that. And no need of calibration. That's the biggest advantage of using a flow track. And then it comes with a attached Vigiligo monitor. So this is the Vigiligo monitor which displays various variables, your cardiac output, stroke volume, stroke volume index, and then resistance index. So whatever comes the values, you need to know the flow chart so that for the interventions to be done. So these are the various parameters which it shows, as I'm mentioning here. I'm not going to repeat all these things. <coughs> so you need to see, one more thing is your stroke volume variation. So if it is more than 13, yes, give a volume challenge and then see it should come less than 10. If it is less than 13, 
and then go for stroke volume index. If the index is normal, you need to go vasopressor. If the index is little bit low, try to increase your inotropic supports. Or if your stroke volume index is high, in these situations, you need to add a diuretic. So you can get these values without any central line, without any peripheral line, by just connecting your arterial line to a flow track. You can get this cardiac output, stroke volume, and then stroke volume variation on your basic pulse contour analysis. But if you want to get these advanced values like SVIR, index SVRI, you need to have a central line, you need to have a CEP entered to the patient or entered in the monitor. Sorry. So these are the continuous variables which you get. Simple arterial line is sufficient for that. But you have a central line in place also. You can get intermittent variables because it gets refreshed every 20 seconds. So intermittent variables again, SVR, global endastolic volume, extrascular lung water. So biggest is if you have a hemosphere for you, this is called as hemosphere here. That is nothing but a monitor with a display is very good here. If you have a hemosphere, it will give you the extrascular lung volume displayed in the machine itself. And the pictorial representation of your extrascular lung volume is the advantage in flow track along with your remaining advantages. So this one is actually the volume V system which is a full flow track here. But you need to have a volume V sensor, same like your previous uh, PICO system. That volume V sensor is incorporated into your central line. And volume V femoral artery catheter. Again, you need to have a separate volume with femoral artery catheter connected to your flow track system. The principle does not change, only the skeleton changes always. <coughs> so this is the whole spectrum of your hemodynamic monitoring coming from invasive techniques, less invasive, non-invasive. So non-invasive has been completely covered by Pankaj. Less invasive techniques, you have done about PICO, LIDCO and your flow tracks. And less invasive, sorry, completely invasive technique is your pulmonary artery catheter. So pulmonary artery catheter uses only your thermodilution curves. Less invasive techniques uses thermodilution along with your pulse contour analysis. Non-invasive uses always the different, that's a different technology that they are using it now. So this is the whole spectrum of your hemodynamic monitoring. I'd like to conclude my talk here. Thank you.